Last time I uh, talked about uh, some preliminary presentation, etc. Today I won't talk about exclusion and discovery. And next time, okay, Kateri will arrange another lecture. I will talk about the Lucas effect because I don't want to run. So I will uh, devote the first part of the lecture to repeat some stuff from last lecture and go on. So I said that basically it's all about uh, numbers and uh, we have uh, luminosity, which is the number of events per centimeter squared integrated over time. We have the cross section and we have an efficiency. So the number of expected events is luminosity times cross section times efficiency. And that's the magic formula. That's all you need to know in a way. So far, we saw, we saw the, for, the following. That I used the Higgs as an example. It's the only particle we found so far. So that's the only example I can give. So the signal is luminosity times the cross-section of what we call the standard model Higgs times the efficiency. For simplicity, I will assume an efficiency of 100%, but doesn't matter. In a counting experiment, we have the number of observed event is uh, S plus B, of course, times the luminosity. So, uh, but you know, there are fluct statistical fluctuation. And so even if the signal is there, mu should be one, but it can fluctuate. And if there's no signal, mu would be zero. So mu is called the signal strength. There is the, the expected one and there is the observed one. If there's only background, the expected mu is zero. If the signal, the expected mu is one. And mu is actually the ratio between the, the observed mu is uh, the ratio between the observed cross-section and the expected one. The expected one is the standard model predicted one. So mu is sigma observed over sigma standard model. So if there's background only, sigma observer is zero. And if there is exactly what we expect, then sigma observer is sigma standard model, so mu is one. So once again, mu is the strength of the signal with respect to the expected standard model one. I uh, denoted the hypothesis by H mu, where H1 is the standard model Higgs, and H0 is the background only hypothesis. So I said that there is a null hypothesis and there is an alternative hypothesis. So our job in uh, statistics energy physics is actually to try and reject the null hypothesis. So you define an hypothesis, you call it a null hypothesis, and you try to reject it in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So for example, if H0 is denoted as the hypothesis of uh, the background only, I try to reject it in favor of an hypothesis with the Higgs, which we call H1, it's some MH. If I manage, if I succeed, if I have a success in rejecting it, then I would call it, of course, we have to quantify everything with numbers. Then I will call it a discovery of a Higgs with a mass MH. So when I try to establish a discovery, I define the null hypothesis as uh, the background only because I want to reject it. And I want to reject it in favor of the hypothesis of the signal, of signal plus background. I can swap them and I can call H1 the hypothesis of the star model with the Higgs at some specific mass. And then if I reject the hypothesis, means that I don't see a Higgs. So I reject it in favor of the background only. That's why I have to define the hypothesis of the, that I want to reject the null hypothesis at some specific mass MH. And when I reject it, I actually exclude the Higgs with this specific mass. So this was actually what I talked about last lecture. I also define the likelihood as the compatibility of the hypothesis with a given data set. 
the likelihood of an hypothesis H is the probability to observe the data that we observe given the hypothesis. This is called the likelihood. So the likelihood is not a probability of the hypothesis that will bring us into Bayesian physics, etc., Bayesian statistics, which I don't want to go into. The likelihood is actually assuming the existence of some hypothesis, what is the probability to see the data that we see. If you like, you can say it's how likely is the hypothesis in light of the data that we observe. So this is likely. Then I talked about test statistics and p-value. This was the plot that I showed. Let's uh, go uh, over it again. So I showed last time how I can uh, generate with the simulation lots of simulated experiments. I can uh, simulate them under the null hypothesis or under the alternative hypothesis. If the null hypothesis, for example, is, uh, is for example, uh, the background only, just an example, then I will generate, I will toss experiment with background only, I define some test statistics, which in this example is the likelihood ratio as I show you, that's what I call the Neiman Pearson test statistic, and I get a, a distribution every time I toss the experiment with background only, in the example I gave last time, I used the null hypothesis as the as a spin one or a zero minus, the one that I want to reject in favor of the Higgs with a spin zero plus, but it uh, doesn't really matter, it doesn't really matter. So I get a distribution, a probability distribution function of the test statistic under the null hypothesis. Now I go to my Monte Carlo, I turn on the button of the alternative hypothesis, it can be with x, it can be a spin zero plus in opposed to spin zero minus that we had in the red one, or whatever. And I get another distribution, which is the distribution of the test statistics of the likelihood ratio under the alternative hypothesis. Yes? Is there a question? Is there a question? Okay. I will continue. Okay, so now I go to one my one LHC experiment after running for, I don't know, three years. In our case, it was from, I don't know, when did we really start? Depends on how you count it, but at least two years of running, two, three years. And you look at the data. You calculate the test statistic and you get one number. One number. We call this number Q observed. This number is a measurement. It's not under any hypothesis. It's a measurement. Is the likelihood ratio in this case with this one data set? Remember what is the likelihood? It's the probability to observe the data that we see under a given hypothesis. So it's a likelihood ratio between the, data, the likelihood of the data that we observe with respect to the null hypothesis over the likelihood of the data we, we observe given the alternate hypothesis. So you don't assume anything. You just look how likely the, the ratio of the likelihoods of one hypothesis with respect to the other. And you get one number. We call it Q. This is this number here. You do see my error, right? Yes, yeah, yes, we do. Yes, we do. It's important. Now, this is the PDF. The red one is the PDF under the null hypothesis. So, if I'm in this direction, all this number here are null hypothesis like. All these test statistics here are under uh, statistics like. This is 
not like, and this is alternative like, this is the error here, not like, alternative like. So the probability to get a result which is less like, more alternative like than the one we observe under the null hypothesis is this red area here. This is called the p-value. P-value is also p-null because p-value is always, unless you specify otherwise, always defined with respect to the null hypothesis, which you try to reject. So it's also called p-0. But this is misleading because zero might be, depends which is the hypothesis, so I don't like it. So it's either p-value or p-null, which is always true. So it's this red area here. So if this number, p null, is very, very small, then you say that it's very unlikely that the null hypothesis is true. And it's more likely that the alternative hypothesis is true. How likely is that the hypothesis? This alarm will go away, don't worry. How likely it is that the hypothesis, that the alternative hypothesis is true when I reject the null hypothesis, when I'm in this red area here? You can answer this, because this is the PDF of the same test statistics under the alternative hypothesis. All this blue area that you see here is actually how likely is that the alternative hypothesis is true when the null hypothesis is rejected. This is called the power. Now, I know it's a little bit misleading, but since this way of showing the test statistics is kind of symmetric, If I go to the left, I'm more null-like. If I go to the right, I'm more alternative-like. So this um, kind of symmetric plot, this Neiman-Pearson test statistics, allows me to, to show you the, not only p-null, but also p-alt. Because p-alt is probability to get a result which is less alternative-like than the observed one. Less alternative like means more la like, so it's more to this direction. So P alt is this light blue area. So the power is simply one minus P alt. So many, many years ago, a guy named Birnbaum came and said that uh, for him, a small P null is not enough evidence against the null hypothesis because it's supposed to be in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So he would only believe it if while we reject the null hypothesis, the probability that the alternative hypothesis is true is high. Or in other words, the power is high. So he suggested to use a, a ratio of P null over the power as a measure for a rejection of the null hypothesis. Alex Reed, uh, without knowing about this paper, rediscovered it uh, about 40 years after that. And uh, we rediscovered the Birnbaum after Alex Reed. So actually, Alex, uh, Alex uh, called it the CLS. There is a reason for the CLS, but I don't want to go into the reason so it's it has to do with the confidence level of the signal because there is sort of a confidence level here of what of the signal because you wouldn't believe the signal if the power is not high enough so it's also called a modified p value p prime is the cls or the modified p value cls is actually attributed to alex reed so this modified p value will be penal over the power, or penal over one minus P alt. So this is CLS. 
Yeah. Any questions about CLS before I move on? Uh, hi. Uh, I just wanted to just try and understand. So, do we when we um, when we reject the null hypothesis, do we only re do we consider the values to the left of Q obs? Q obs? Uh, in a way, yes, because when you do CLS, you consider the value to the right of the delay, it doesn't matter. You consider the, right, the because the, the, the right is not one minus the left, because the each PDF is a probability distribution. So it, it sums up the integration of this probability. The, the power the power is one minus p alt because it, it, the, the area of the blue is one so i consider the power this is what i consider but the power has to do with the values of the of the okay. alternative test statistic yeah. to the left and then p null is of course one minus all the the sum of all the integration of the of the pdf to the left of the observe so left or right is only relative because they sum up to one yeah. so when i do when i reject an hypothesis and when i do cls when i take this uh, this caution that member suggested when i say don't reject an hypothesis without making sure that the alternative po the alternative hypothesis is true i actually take both distributions into account the alternative and the null does this answer your question yeah no um so you said earlier on that um the the probability to reject to 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 reject the null hypothesis is is, is kind of determined by how small p null is right mm. that has um, to do with that, that, that uh, how, how how small i will talk in a second this is kind of an agreement this is kind of a standard okay okay that depends what is the alternative hypothesis. If the alternative if the, the null hypothesis is the background only, then one is very careful about uh, rejecting it because everybody is very sure of the background only because we know it very well. So in order to make a statement that we discovered something we require that the rejection of the null hypothesis will be at a very, very high standard, meaning something like 10 to the minus seven. Only if P is less than Two point something ten to the minus seven that we reject it, but if we try to exclude a signal, meaning that another hypothesis is is, uh, is a signal, and you try to reject it in order to exclude it in favor of the background only, then the standards are to use uh, a much much uh, conservative, uh, a much much less conservative number, less conservative like five percent. You see the difference is huge between five percent and. Uh, 10 to the minus 5%. This is a bit crazy, okay? I mean, people are very, very careful about, about making a discovery and they allow themselves to, to exclude the signal at the risk that maybe they are mistaken and the signal will reappear later. They don't care about that. Okay. There is a reason it has to do with the local effect, but this, uh, this will be next lecture. Okay. Okay, this is the numerical example I gave last time. I'm not going to go over this now because it's all clear after all I said, but you can read it later and look again. I also said last uh, lecture about, uh, about the agreement. Well, how do we come, come to this, the correspondence between the significance and the p-value? So when the PDF of a statistical test of a test statistics is Gaussian, there, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the p-value, the area here, which is given by this uh, integral. This integral is actually the integral from minus infinite to the observed value. This integral of this area here is called phi. If this area is one, oh, sorry. If this area is one, then you can measure this 
x axis in the, how many standard deviation you are from zero. So p value is one minus the integral up to z sigma. And for a unit Gaussian, sigma is one. So z sigma is simply z. So the p value is one minus the integral phi of z. We will continue seeing the, the, this uh, function, uh, which is called the error function. We'll continue seeing it. This phi of z, so uh, that's why I spent some time on this. So phi is the integral from minus infinity to z. And one minus phi is the p-value. If one minus phi is the p-value, you can actually invert it, make, take the inversion of this function to find a significant. Z is the inversion of the phi function, phi minus one of one minus the p-value. Take this, one minus p is phi of z. So z is phi minus one of one minus p. So a significance of five standard deviation correspond to a p-value of 2.8, 10 to the minus seven. You must have heard about it. That's the magic number of five sigma. So this is what I said as an answer before. When testing the Bergen hypothesis, it is custom to set the p-value to be 2.9, 10 to the minus seven as a criteria for rejecting the Bergen only hypothesis and make a discovery. When testing the signal hypothesis, or what we call the signal plus Bergen hypothesis, because you cannot really tell, uh, you cannot really isolate the signal, it always comes with the Bergen. So the hypothesis is S plus B. So when testing the S plus B hypothesis, then uh, your criteria is much, much looser, it's 5%. If the p-value of the S plus B is less than 5%, we check the signal hypothesis at what we call the 95% confidence level. And that will lead to exclusion of the signal. Okay. Any questions up to now? So I want to talk uh, a little bit more about something I neglected last time, but I noticed by uh, your questions later that it was not really clear. What is a nuisance parameter? There are two kinds of uh, parameters. There are parameters of interest that you want to measure, like the signal strength. Sometimes it's a cross section. And there are nuisance parameters. They are there. They affect our measurement, but we don't really care what they are. All we care is to be able to measure them well well means with a very small error as possible. So the effect on our measurement is minimized. That, these are called nuisance parameters. They can be the background, they can be the, the signal efficiency, the resolution, the energy scale, the resolution of the energy of the mass or whatever. So the nuisance parameters carry systematic uncertainties which affect a lot your measurement and you want to minimize it but you cannot escape it. They are there and they actually dictate the whole result. If you have a control on your nuisance parameters, you win against your competitor experiment. This is where the magic is. So there's something called the pool of nuisance parameter. So if theta is some nuisance parameter, then there is the measurement of theta, which we call theta hat, which means that you take the likelihood of your hypothesis and you maximize the likelihood or minimize the log likelihood, it's the same thing. You maximize the likelihood under all the nuisance parameters and the ones that maximize the likelihood are called theta hat. So the pool is theta hat minus theta, theta zero, which is your expected the nuisance parameter, divided by the expected error, a certainty on this. So you see that you expect that the standard deviation of the pool will be sigma of theta hat minus theta zero over sigma zero. So theta zero is a number, there's no sigma on this. 
sigma of theta eight is supposed to be sigma zero, so it becomes one. And the expectation of theta hat minus theta zero over sigma zero is zero because the expectation of theta hat should be theta zero. It's a good habit to look at the pools of the nuisance parameters and make sure that uh, nothing irregular is seen. Some of you maybe have seen these plots, but uh, I thought it's too difficult to try and uh, address it here. In particular, one would like to guarantee that uh, all the fits that you do to all the parameters do not over constrain some nuisance parameter and give you some nuisance parameter with a sigma of zero or something like this, which is not normal. So people look at these pools and probably you've seen these plots, but I'm not gonna go into this here because it will take me another half an hour, which I don't want to spend here. I don't think it's justified. Maybe if we finish and I have time in the third lecture. How do you take all these usage parameters into account? There are two ways to do it. One of them is by integration. This is called marginalizing. And it's a Bayesian way, you can why. Another is a frequentist way, it's called profiling, and that's the one that I want to talk about. So what is the generalization? Suppose you want to, you have uh, the, the single strength that you measure. You want to find the likelihood of, the, of your data with the, the hypothesis of some u, could be one for a signal of zero for a big one. But the measurement is also depends on new parameter which are called theta. So I can integrate the likelihood of mu comma theta because the likelihood is also depends on theta. But I don't know what is theta. There is some distribution of theta. And I don't know exactly what is theta. This distribution of theta is called the prior on theta. It's called pi of theta. Sometimes I don't know it. I believe that it's given by a Gaussian. I believe that it's given by some distribution. So it's a prior, that's what we call a prior and it, uh, it has to do with some degree of belief. What I believe is the distribution of the Nusselt parameter. Nusselt parameter is tricky. I integrate over all possibilities of Nusselt parameters, like taking some kind of an average expectation and I'm left with L of mu. This is called margin marginalization or integrating out the Nusselt parameter. Now you can actually do an habit method in which you do something which is a mixture between likelihood ratio, which is frequentist, and marginalization of the new parameter. For example, if I want to know the likelihood ratio, that's the Niemann Pearson, of the two hypotheses, likelihood of S plus B over likelihood of B. But B is a new parameter, depends on a set of new parameters which are called theta. So if I want to integrate out the Nusselt parameter here, it will be L of S plus B of theta, pi of theta, D theta. And if I integrate the Nusselt parameter here, it's L of B of theta, pi of theta, D theta. So each term by itself has an integration and has the Bayesian factor of the prior here, each term. But the ratio, which forms a test statistic, I treat it in a frequentist way, meaning that I will toss experiments and see how the test statistics distributes. This is called the Cousins Heil method. Bob Cousins, who is a legend in statistical high energy physics, and Highland, who unfortunately died while writing this paper with Bob. Anyway, so. This is all I'm going to say about integrating this parameter, but you should see it because you might encounter it. A more uh, modern and uh, easier way to deal with this parameter is to profile them. What does it mean to profile them? So this is what I want to spend uh, the time now. Okay. Please follow me, I will uh, guide you. I will... Suppose the likelihood is a function of the parameter of interest mu and use of parameter theta. Now suppose the likelihood has the shape of, uh, I don't know, an inverse hat or something like this, a valley. <coughs> That's the minimum likelihood. 
Now, if I go, if I, if I do contours of constant z, constant significance of the likelihood, the minimum is here, it's called z0, and then there's v, z1, z2, oh, sorry, z2, z3. Okay, so here in the middle, that's the minimum likelihood, which means that I scan the both parameters, the parameter of interest mu and the use of parameter theta, and this is where the likelihood gets its minimum. So it's likelihood of mu hat theta hat here. That's the absolute minimum of everything. But I can stop here at any any theta at any new parameter here and look where the likelihood gets its minimum given this theta. There is a mu that gives the likelihood a minimum at this specific theta. This mu that gives the likelihood the minimum at a specific theta, it's called mu double hat of theta. So I can plot mu double hat of theta as a function of theta. It's this plot here. So given theta, for example, if theta is here, this place is where the likelihood gets its minimum with this theta. Theta hat. But when theta is theta hat, mu is also mu hat. So this is why mu double hat of theta hat is mu hat. I hope you get it. So here I try to do, I'm a very bad painter, okay? Here I try to look at, uh, at this likelihood. This is the minimum which occurs at mu hat theta hat. And at the minimum, dl to d mu equal dl to d theta equal zero. Now I can take a slice here. This is the slice. You see, that's when the slice, I'm a very bad painter, I'm sorry. That's when the slice cuts this likelihood. So at this place here, for example, here I took the opposite approach. I take mu equals five. This is when mu equals five. So there is a slash here. See, I cut here. And there's a slice here that cuts the likelihood. And you see the red thing here? This is the likelihood when I fix mu to five. So it's the likelihood of five, of mu equal five as a function of theta. This axis is the theta x. When does it get its minimum, this red curve here? Mu is fixed to be five. But theta, well, the likelihood gets its minimum, and I fix mu to five, is called theta double hat of five, or theta hat of five. So that's the meaning of double hat. When I put a double hat on something, it means it's a constrained minima. It's the minima of the likelihood, but constraint of the value of another parameter to be fixed, in this case, five. I hope you understood it. Are there questions about the definition of the double head? I had a question about uh, the, the slide with the nuisance parameter. I, I came across a term called uh, global observables. I was, I was wondering what the difference is between nuisance parameters and global observables. I'm not sure I know the answer to this one because I didn't encounter this uh, term. David, do you know? Not sure. No, I'm a global observable. Uh, where did you find this caller? Uh, the tutorial, it's uh, the tutorial on roostats that uh, Will Buttinger um, had on Twiki. 
So, so you know what it is. You can inform us then. What, well, what I, 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 there, there's an example of a global observable. You listed lumino, like you integrated luminosity as one of the global observables, but it, it, the definition wasn't really clear from what you were saying. I was okay, maybe you can you can uh, uh, get a link and and send it uh, around. Yeah, I can look at it for the next lecture. I can look at it. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe if, if it's the luminosity, the thing about the luminosity that it appears in both the denominator and the numerator, and then the systematic is sort of cancels out. Okay. So maybe it has to do with this, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. So since this is a very difficult subject, you see I have even another slide. For example, what does it mean when I say that the test statistics is L of S comma B double hat over L of S hat B hat? This exactly means this. The numerator is the likelihood of the likelihood of S, but where I actually scan the B, the B Newton's parameter, back on Newton's parameter, fixing s so it's the maximum of the likelihood of s b where i scan over b so when i find the maximum likelihood it occurs for b which we call b double head so it's b double head it's also b double head of s or b head of s people will use this or this or this that's what it means and then the denominator is l of s head b head now you see, sometimes I use maximum likelihood, something I use minimum. It doesn't matter because uh, if I will, uh, will invert the denominator and numerator, they will exchange role. And also when I lose minus log, it exchange role. So you have to look at where you are because you know what you want. You want extremum to the likelihood. So if I have, whenever I fix S, I can find the B which will maximize the likelihood in this case, which will I call B double head of S. In this place here, both S and B, when I scan them, maximize the likelihood. So this is L of S at B head. So it's the maximum of the likelihood when I scan over both S and B. So this is the, if I had an ellipse here, this is the middle of the ellipse here. Okay, I think now I can, actually I did all of this because of a question that was raised last time, which they asked me, so what's the advantage of, uh, of a profile likelihood? So the advantage is something called Wilkes theorem. Wilkes theorem tells us that if I look at the likelihood ratio of mu theta double head, Theta double head is theta double head of mu. Okay, it's fixing mu. Find the maximum likelihood when I scan over theta, fixing mu. This is always smaller than the denominator. Because in the denominator, the likelihood is maximal over all the parameters. So this is always a fraction as it's defined here. Because if I go away from mu hat or from theta hat, the likelihood gets a smaller value. The likelihood is maximum for mu hat and theta hat. So if I go away from it, like if I fix mu to be something and I look at the likelihood with theta double hat, so I scan theta and find the maximum likelihood given theta and fixing mu, this will be a fraction. So if I look at the log of a fraction, it's negative. So I take minus two times the log, so it's always positive. Minus two log of the profile likelihood is always positive. So the profile likelihood test statistics is defined as minus two log of lambda of mu or minus two log of L of mu over L of mu hat. 
Now, Weeks tells us that no matter what are the new parameters, no matter, this is always distributed as a chi-square with one degree of freedom because I have only one parameter of interest, mu. A generalized Willis theorem tell us that when I have more than one parameter of interest, for example, uh, I know um, I can look at the mass and the width as initial parameter, as parameters of interest when I try to measure the mass of the width of a particle. So it's two parameters, of, for example. So for if I have n Newton's parameter, let's denote them by mu i, mu one, two, three, and I can have an infinite number of Newton's parameters, it doesn't matter. As long as I take L of mu over L of mu hat or, and theta double hit over theta hit, hat, theta double hat over theta hat, then minus two log of lambda of mu i will always distribute a sky square with n degrees of freedom, no matter what are the new parameters and how many I have. That makes life very easy. Now, this is a slide from last lecture where this is all I showed about the profile like that, and I can see why it was very difficult to understand, but now it should be very clear. All these terms are equivalent, it's just different ways to write the same thing. If the test statistic, when I test the mu hypothesis, which means I test an hypothesis signal with the strength of mu, so it's minus two log of L of mu s plus b double hat mu over mu it has plus b hat, which means that I take the maximum likelihood fixing mu scan over b over the maximum likelihood when I scan over both mu and b. Sometimes people call it q hat or q of mu hat, but it's the same thing. Okay, I, I finished defining the profile likelihood. Any questions? Okay, now we can move on. So we know by weeks that the distribution of the blue test statistic, which is Q null under H null, which can be Q0 under H0 or Q1 under H1, is chi squared with one degree of freedom. That's what you see here. What people didn't know for years is what is the distribution of the null hypothesis under the alternative hypothesis, which is given in this thing here. It should be f of q0 given h1 or f of q1 given h0. Okay, this, this is the reference to Wilkes. I don't see any new thing in this slide, so I move on. I showed already this slide where I give you a table which does not appear in a paper, but, but it can help you a lot to show you what are the test statistics that people use and for which purpose they use them, what's the expression of the test statistic. So the two most famous test statistics are called Q0 and Q mu. Just like the name say, in Q0, you test the Began hypothesis in order to reject it in favor of a alternative hypothesis, which is a signal, so you want to make a discovery. So a slight tweak of the definition is this zero thing here. So I define Q0 as minus two log of lambda of zero, where lambda of zero is L of zero over L of mu hat. I will not anymore set a double hat of zero over theta hat because it's clear. This is profiling and use parameters. I know that it's a kind of a legitimate way to do it. It's a kosher way. I know that when I do it, the, the distribution will not depend on use of parameters. So I split the definition. If mu hat is more than zero, which means there's an upward fluctuation on the background, everything is okay. But if mu hat is less than zero, and 
10 events on the signal and I observe 90 events. So mu hat is minus 10 over 100, is minus 0.1. Well, what do I do with it? I might say, ah, so my data is incompatible with the background hypothesis and I can reject it, but not in favor of the signal hypothesis. So we don't want to do it. We don't want the downward fluctuation of the background, which might occur, will serve as an evidence against the background. So if mu hat is less than zero, we simply ignore it. So we set the test statistics to zero. Same thing, when I test the signal in order to exclude it, to exclude it, when would I exclude a signal? If I expect 150 with a signal and I see 100, then obviously I don't see a signal and I can reject it. So I exclude the Higgs that predict 150 events. But if I see 300 events instead of 150, this is incompatible with both the background only for 100 and incompatible with the signal plus background that I test, 150. But this is great. Maybe I do have a signal, so I don't want to reject the signal hypothesis. So when I test the signal hypothesis, upward fluctuation of the signal will not serve as an evidence against the signal. So this is why the definition is, when I test the mu hypothesis, is minus two log lambda mu. When I have downward fluctuation, my mu hat is less than mu, and zero if I have upward fluctuation. Mu hat is greater than mu. I hope you understand it. Other questions about it? So this is the paper by uh, Glenn, Kyle, uh, Offer, and myself, which define all the, uh, the uh, approximate uh, symptotic formula. Melissa, now why do I need it? If I look in this distribution here, this one here, if you like, this one here, if I want to, measure it, I will need to generate, say, uh, say, just say, a million, to toss a million signal plus background events. So, uh, or a million background events, if I want to exclude the signal. If each background event can take 10 minutes to generate, you will need a lifetime to do it. So we prefer to use some formula, cross formula if we have. So this closed formula, I showed you last time that we got it from something called the wall theorem. I will not go again over the wall theorem because it's not easy and it will not really teach us anything new. All we need to know about wall that it's from 1943 and using the world formalism, which is given in this thing here, we could predict the shape of the test statistics of the null hypothesis, when I test the null hypothesis under the alternative hypothesis. <clears throat> so, Wald, if Wilkes give us the distribution of the test statistics of, of Q null under H null, which is a chi-square, Wald will give me some complicated formula, which is the test statistics, the distribution of test statistics under the alternative hypothesis. So the blue is, for example, f of q1, when I test the signal hypothesis under the signal, the chi squared, in order to exclude the signal. And the orange one is the same test statistic, q1, but under the background only, under zero. This is given by Wald. Now, last time I also explained to you about the Asimov data set. I said that the Asimov data set is when I want to calculate what is the median of this distribution. Now, of course, you understand that if I have the formula, I can easily get the Asimov, the median. 
So using the formula that we derived, we could actually show that there is one specific data set that once I plug it in, I get the median of the blue distribution. This data set is always the nominal alternative data set, meaning if I test the background hypothesis for a discovery, then the median of the distribution of Q0 under one, Q0 is when I test the background only, Q0 under zero is when I toss only background experiments so I get the orange distribution. And when I toss signal experiments, then Q0 is given by this world formula here. So when I test it, the median will be given if instead of the data, I will plug in one data set, which is the nominal, nominal alternative data set without fluctuation, meaning if the alternative is the signal, so all I have to do is plug in N equals simply S plus B, the nominal one without fluctuations. And this will give me the median. You see here, when I do the experiments, the median is given by the red thing here. When I use the assume data set, which means that I plug in N equal S plus B, or I plug in mu hat equal one, because, because N equal mu hat S plus B. So if mu hat is one, it's just S plus B. So plug, when I plug in the assume data set, then the median is given by the green, which is just one number that I get with plugging in the asymptote of data set. So when you see people say that, uh, let's do the asymptote, let's do the asymptote, what they mean is that they take the alternative hypothesis, they plug in the expected alternative parameters, as they are, without fluctuations. The one that are expected, in an ideal world, without fluctuations, for example, if I test the signal plus background, the assume data set will be background only, just B, or mu hat equals zero. Okay, any questions about the move? So when you when you take the median of your of, of your experimental data set, is there like some sort of assumption that the 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 the, the, dot, the data set is is um, symmetric no why should it be symmetric in what sense symmetric because the data set follows the asymptotic formalism but that occurs already for 10 events so in most cases there is no problem okay so ilam could you just clarify a little bit what you mean by toss and experiment yes <clears throat> Those an experiment is what I did the, in the last lecture when I go to my Monte Carlo and I say, okay, I expect 100 signal event, a 100 background event and 10 signal events. So let's assume that uh, I have a cross section for the signal, a cross section for the background. So toss meaning that uh, I use the, uh, I use the, uh, it's actually uh, like a tossing, uh, I suddenly forgot the words in English. Uh, the dice, coins, you mean? Not coins, uh, how do you call dice? these things? Dice. Dice, dice. Like tossing a dice. I toss a dice with a binomial distribution and the, the, which means I toss a dice, there is some probability for, for, for giving what I have, giving what I expect, and one minus this probability not to get it exactly. So I toss a dice. Okay, I think I complicate things. All you do is you go to your Monte Carlo and you actually run one experiment, and, uh, but this time I, I take a luminosity, say, of, uh, of two years. So this is why it takes so long. An experiment is, is, is tossing, say, uh, one million events. This is an experiment. So tossing experiment is tossing two million events, say, or I don't know, two billion events, and, and, and get some results. 
Now, if you will now do another experiment, since everything fluctuates, you will get a different result. Those things mean that you actually use the, you plug in the statistic fluctuation and get every time different outcome. But tossing an experiment is not tossing one signal and one background. It's tossing millions of, like depends on the luminosity, each, millions of collisions. It's tossing a collision, it's simulate a collision. Tossing an experiment is simulate a, N collision depends on your luminosity. So it can be simulate a, a million collisions. This is tossing an experiment. Is this satisfying this answer? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Time is running. <laughs> this is difficult stuff. Okay, I hope that I will manage to do the exclusion at least. So I will be at what I want, where I wanted to be last lecture. So I decided to start with actually showing you how I, reje how I reject an, the signal hypothesis, not by discovery, by exclusion, because that's what we do these days, unfortunately, and that's what we did for many, many years before the Higgs discovery. So what I do is I assume there is a signal and that can go on now, not only for the Higgs, that can be if you look for an exotic Z, if you look for a supersymmetric, if you look for a leptoquark, any crazy signal model that you have, have some prediction. And the prediction tells you there is a cross section for the signal and the number of events you expect to see is mu s plus b, where s is the luminosity times the cross section of the exotic signal that you are expecting and b is the background. So I, define the test statistics where I test the signal hypothesis with a strength mu. So it's minus two log of lambda of mu, where I allow the signal plus background to fluctuate down. But if I have suddenly upward fluctuation of the signal plus background, I will never use it as a measure to reject the signal hypothesis, say, if I expect 150 events of signal plus background, and I get, say, 130 observed events, so mu is minus 20 over 150. But if I get 170 events, mu is positive, it's more than one. So it's 170 over 150, it's one point something, 1.1 1 .1 something. So if mu hat is greater than mu, if mu, then I don't want to reject the signal hypothesis. So I set it to zero. If mu hat is less than mu, say I get 130 instead of 150. So 130 over 150 is 0 0.8 or 0 0.9. I get 0 0.9 of the signal that I expect. Then I, I will use it as an evidence against the signal. So if mu hat is less than mu, I will define the test statistics minus two log lambda of mu. Lambda of mu is the ratio of the likelihood, likelihood of mu over likelihood of mu hat, and zero if mu hat is greater than mu. Again, output fluctuation of the signal do not serve as an evidence against the signal. So here's how it goes. No matter what is the physics process that you're doing now, supersymmetry, exotics, leptoquarks, I don't know what, graptons, whatever, the distribution of the test statistic under your signal hypothesis is a chi-square. This is Wilkes. Sorry. What gives me the distribution of the test statistics under the background only hypothesis, the alternative? It's given by this formula here. This is what comes out from my paper and I'm not gonna go into how we derive it. It's in the paper and it doesn't matter at all. It's some crazy stuff that you get, well-defined, and once you understand the trick, it's even easy to de derive, but you have to understand how it goes. That you can read in the paper. It doesn't matter. I have this distribution. Now, just as a sanity check, I check that the median of Q1 
under zero. When I toss experiment, that's the fluctuation that you see here, agrees with the Asium data set, which is given by the analytical expression that we have. So this is actually the Q1, that's the test statistics, with the Asium of data set. The Asium of data set is the alternative nominal data set. So in our case, when I test the single hypothesis, the alternative is the background only, so mu hat equals zero. That's all there is to do. And you get the red one, or the green one, but they coincide as we expect. So this is the whole story. You see, if you have both formulas, you could do anything you like. You can analytically derive the p-value, you can analytically derive the power, you can analytical uh, derive the modified p-value, which is the ratio between the p-value and the power. The power is with the area from here to here, but if you have the formula, you have the integration, you have everything. So, here is in how you do an exclusion at the 95% confidence level. Suppose I test hypothesis H mu. We calculate the test statistics with proper likelihood, with the one observed data. Square, I have the world, this is this distribution, and all I have to do from the experiment is to get one number, which is the test statistics calculated, the likelihood ratio calculated with the observed data. It's one number, given here. And that's one number coming from LHC, where each number here, if I toast it, equal to an LXC experiment. And maybe that's what Kateri wanted me to clarify. The tossing an experiment is not a whole LHC experiment. It's not one collision, it's a billion collisions. So I have my observed Q value here. Now, the Casper has to do with the null hypothesis. So the p-value is given here. That's the p-value of the null hypothesis. Now, in principle, we could stop here. If the blue area is less than 5%, I exclude the hypothesis of the signal of a signal with some mass, given mass, at the 95% confidence level. You have to remember that the hypothesis H mu always, is always given with a specific signal model in mind. It's the specific mass, specific weight, specific signal. It's not a Higgs, it's a Higgs with a specific mass. It's not just Susie. It's uh, Susie, Neutralino versus Gagino, whatever, with a specific masses spectrum. Now, how do I find an upper limit? This is a little bit complicated uh, slide, I apologize, because it's a complicated issue, but you have a, in, a, in root or root stat, you have a, just a, you plug in and it gives it to you. But what does it do inside? What does it do inside? I'm not gonna go over all this, but just go to the end. What it tries to do is to solve the formula, which is mu up is which is the signal strength that will give it a p-value of 5%? Which is the signal strength that will give me a p-value of 5%? Now, why, why is it called upper limit? Because it's mu less than something. Because if mu will be bigger than that, then uh, the p-value will not answer this equation here. I, can, I, I don't have sensitivity to do. I can only do up to 5%. So I want to solve mu up equals mu hat is my measurement, plus the standard deviation of mu, which is called sigma of mu hat, times 
But the problem that we have is that the uncertainty on new head depends on new up. And this was a, an issue which was very hard to resolve. And the only way to resolve it is numerically. So first, uh, let me show you, this is actually, this is the chi-square. That's how the chi-square looks like uh, in log scale. It's uh, actually a straight line. And this is the p-value. This is a p-value which you want it to be less than equal 5%. And when I want to do the expected mu up, I actually find this, the mu that will give me exactly 5%. That's the best I can do. So I go numerically and I solve it. That is done in the routine that you are using. But I actually solve for 1.64 sigma of mu up, which is a function of mu, which is a function of mu up. And it's given by mu up or square root of the asim of test statistic. I'm not going to go for the proof of this, but you have to solve this formula, mu equal mu up, and mu equal 1.64 mu up over square root of mu up Asimov. And this intersection point gives you the solution, which in this case is 0.47, it doesn't matter. The thing is that I can find the expected upper limit this way. So what you do in the end is that you can use Monte Carlo simulations. Actually, you can use Monte Carlo. You can use Monte Carlo. I see many people left me, I see, because it's probably too difficult, but I try to do my best for it. <laughs> okay. You know, uh, some people told me that they, they needed to go, uh, including Christine, but we still have uh, most of the ASP oh, okay. alumni. I hear, I hear the blips. <laughs> okay. So what you see here, and that's, that, that's what I wanted to show you, okay? You see many times that people show you the green and yellow band and show you the expected upper limits there and the uncertainty bands. So this is exactly what you do here. The expected upper value is given here. The uncertainty band are given with n equal one and two, because if I have this distribution here, I can easily calculate from this uh, shape here, because I have the analytical formula of this, easily calculate the L bands, the median, everything. So actually, instead of tossing experiment and decide where I have the one sigma, two sigma, and where I have the median, I can simply use the analytical formula and get it immediately. And then I can, and, and I can do it, this is for a specific mass of the Higgs, for example. I can do it for each mass, and actually, it's very easy. What you see here is that I can get the green band, which is the expectation for each mass, which is the one plus minus one arrow band, plus minus two sigma arrow band, and on top of it, I actually plot the observed, the observed upper limit, which was given by this formula here that I had it, mu hat plus 1.64 sigma mu hat of mu up. If I do the expectation for the expectation, then I know that the mu hat is the asimov of the alternative, which is zero. So for the expectation, it's just sigma of mu hat mu up times 1.64. But for the observation, I have to take mu hat into account. So this is what you see here. This is the observed for each mass. Each one of this is a procedure. Each one of this of them is a different procedure. Okay, that's that's about uh, uh, the Brazil plot. And this is the you see all these plots that you see in LHC. All these plots look like this. They're all made with these formulas and. Uh, and this formula, instead of tossing a series of experiment at each mass point, you can simply take the analytical formulas and derive the values. And that's what is hidden behind the routines that you're using to derive your upper limit. Now I still have some time, so I want to talk about Q0 for discovery. 
So Q0 is simply given by minus two log of likelihood of zero over likelihood of mu hat. And when mu hat is less than zero, it's zero, which means that if I expect 100 background event and I see 80, I will not reject the background. But if I expect 100 event and I see 150, I will reject the background. So downward fluctuation of the background do not serve as an evidence against the background. So this is why I define Q0 in two parts. When I have an upward fluctuation, it's kosher. When I have a downward fluctuation, I define it as zero. Now, Q0 is my test statistics. F of Q0 under zero is given by a chi square. This is the Wilkes formula. F of Q0 under one is given here, this line here. And this is given by the world formulas. As you see again, the asymptote agrees perfectly with the median. Another thing that uh, I prove here is as funny as it looks like, if you take the profile likelihood value Q0 and you take the square root of it, you get the significance. So if E Q0 is 25, you have a significance, 25 is here, you have a significance of five, five sigma, and your p-value will be 2.8, 10 to the minus seven. If this zero is 16, if a Q0 is 16, you have four sigma, etc. So sometimes people plot the p-value as a function of the mass, because when you have the analytical formulas, it's very easy to do multi-plots. So they say, okay, let's assume the mass of the signal is 110, and let's see how this, uh, and let's see what is the p-value when the signal hypothesis is 110, and they get this value. And then they can scan all the masses and get this p-value. Using square root of Q0 equals Z, they can translate this p-value into one, two, three, four, five sigma, etc. And you see the smaller the p-value, you see the smaller the p-value, you are more to this side, then your Q0 is bigger and your Z is bigger. So this is why you see that the smaller the p-value, the significance is increasing. So this is the observed p-value. And this is one example of what would be the p-value given a specific mass for the Higgs, which is 125. So that's what I would expect for a 125 Higgs. So this value I have to compare with the value here because this is the value of the observed p-value given a, a mass of the Higgs, which is 110, 120, 125 here. So what do I learn from this value here, for example? If I would have seen a Higgs with exactly the expected cross section from the standard model, I would have expected in this example to see a three sigma. But the p-value that I observe is much, much smaller corresponds almost to 3.5 to 8.6 sigma. What does it mean? What do you think that it means? Can somebody try to answer, just burst into the discussion and tell me if it means that I see more events or less events? Just feel free to enter the discussion because you're not that many. It means you see more events, right? Right, I see more events, so it's less likely that it comes from background. So the p-value is much, much smaller, and, uh, and uh, this is what I get here. And uh, th this will, uh, and, and, and what you see here, that the meaning of this is that the mu hat, which is sigma over observer or sigma expected, the less the p-value, the mu hat is bigger, okay? So you see, for a signal of 125 as we expect, mu hat will be one exactly 125. If I see more, ev more events, the mu hat will be bigger. That's the meaning of this. So this is, for example, just some result I took from the history from 2012. 
close to the Higgs discovery. That uh, was my favorite one because this is when we understood that we see something. But uh, you see here that uh, what happens is when you have a discovery, the p-value is simply be, gives you a kind of a peak, downward fluctuating peak. I will uh, end the lecture with uh, some magic that you the, the significance, the expected significance is given by the square root of Q0. So I can plug in the Asimov data set. So suppose I want to know what is the median of the Z0 given the signal hypothesis, some signal hypothesis. So you plug in the formula for Q0 with the Asimov data set. Asimov data set is simply S plus B. So you get this formula here. Now it turns out that this formula when S over B is much, much, much smaller than one, becoming a famous S over square root of B. The meaning of this is that we have a better formula for the significance, for the back of the envelope significance at S over square root of B. You can see it here very well. Here, the red, you have a, a few cases here, where you have S equal two, S equal five, and S equal 10. And the background goes from 0 0.01 to 100. The dots are the exact measurement of the significance. The red lines are what you estimate the significance to B when you use S over square root of B. So you see, it's good only when S over B is very, very small. But if I use the Asimov formula, this is crazy. You can use it all over. Even when I have S equal two and B equal 10 to the minus one or 10 to the minus, or two 10 to the minus one, three 10 to the minus one, the Asimov formula works. So I didn't manage, we didn't manage to push it hard enough, but one shouldn't use S over square root of B because this works much, much better. Instead of S over square root of B, use this one, which is a byproduct of the Asimov formula. Use this one to estimate your significance. Then you know that you're not doing nonsense and you're always correct, no matter how small are the numbers. So next time I will talk about the Lukács effect. And if you have more questions, I see very few people remain till the very end. So I'm not sure what to do next time because I need the Q0 for the Lukács effect. Maybe I'll start again from the Q0 next time. I think, I think the people who are really, who should be listening to your lecture are here, which uh, is- But the, only, besides uh, Peter and you and Steve, there are only two people here. <laughs> No, no, no. No, yeah. there are 16, 16 people connected in total. Ah, so why do I see only, ah. There are 16 people connected. Ah, no, 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 I made a mistake the way I looked at it. Okay, okay, okay. okay. 16 is, 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 beyond, is beyond my uh, approximation. It's okay, it's, a, it's, a, it's a asymptotic. Okay, so next time I will use the Q0 in order to do, you will find me a time, uh, Kutevi, I will use the Q0 in order to do the look at, so, but now I'm open for a question or two or three. There are. Um, Ailam, I just, I wanted you to clarify something. Could you tell the story about Asimov? He, he was not a physicist, but- uh, Ah, yeah, yeah. Why yeah. is he called Asimov data yeah, set? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Uh, actually, I will move to another presentation to explain this. Give me a second. Any presentation that I have in the Asimov is, actually I had it in my lecture one. So I just moved to lecture one, so I stopped this share. And I move to another share. Sorry, I don't stop the share. So I don't know where to stop the share. Cannot see where I stop the share. One second. Yeah, why can't I see the share? I suppose I'm doing this. 
Ah, here it's Tov Share. Okay, now I will share something else. Okay, and you will see it. Okay. Let's go to the Asi move here. Ah. Okay, do you see Asimov here? Okay, so Asimov is the writer. Asimov is a writer. And he had a story called uh, Le Franchise. And I read the story when I was uh, in high school and it influenced my life. And that's how the Asimov came to be. Let me explain what was the story about. The story was that in the future, by the way, he was talking about uh, 2006 or something. I mean, we are already beyond this future. In the future, the United States, uh, we decide to do an electronic democracy where well, the computer, which is called Multivax, will go to the population. And since uh, we all have a big brother, and since the computer knows us, which is true even today, I mean, uh, the governments know everything about us. So Asimov assumed that they will also know our political uh, views, okay? Which is also correct. And uh, therefore, they know the characteristic of each person in the population. And therefore, they can actually uh, choose the person which has the average uh, characteristics, expected characteristics. So uh, if you take every characteristic of person, they do a, a histogram of this, find the average. There should be one person which holds all the average characteristics of everything. Okay? Now, instead of taking the whole population, ask each one to vote, and then take the expectation of all the votes. Let's take the expected voter and use his vote as a measure for the expectation of all the other voters. So the idea was the use of a signal representative individual to stand in for the entire population. And uh, then when we, and then when uh, we, did, we thought of how can we do this, this thing, we noticed that everybody was doing the ASIMOV data set. We did not invent the use of the ASIMOV data set. And the ASIMOV data set was simply replaced an ensemble of simulated experiment with one single representative, and everybody was taking S plus B to get the sensitivity. And uh, I went to Bob Cousins and I told him, listen, uh, this S plus B works great. Uh, I want to write a paper about it because everybody uses this and nobody writes a paper about it. So Bob Cousins told me, come on, this is bullshit. You write a paper about a, a thing that everybody knows, go and prove that this uh, one Asimov data set is doing a trick. And that's how the Asimov paper was born. When we tried to prove the Asimov, we got all the symptotic formulas. That's a true story. So this is the story of the Asimov. Asimov was a writer and uh, it comes from a story. Well, you use one voter instead of the one voter and you take its average characteristics as a measure for the average of the whole population. Okay, that was the full answer, right? Thank you. Um, there, there is one question by Xola. M maybe you want to sp yeah. ask your question, uh, yeah. yeah, so, so, so I, I see also, um, you were saying that you were trying to use uh, Asimov's data set to estimate the, the significance for the Higgs discovery, if I'm not mistaken. This well, I mean, I use it. You can look at the paper, yes. Was there much of a difference between the, your, your, how, you, how you estimated the, the, the significance and okay. the published? Okay, well, discovery is a very tricky issue. Let me explain because the measure for discovery is five standard deviation. So at the time, <laughs> that means that if you, we don't use the ASIMO, we will have to generate uh, uh, more than a billion uh, Monte Carlo events, especially when we combine CMS and ATLAS. It was a man, we did not even know how to do a simulation of both experiments together because of, uh, of uh, correlations between systematics and all this. And ASIMO was actually, or the asymptotic were actually the only way to, to estimate these things. Now, many, many people try to test our, uh, our uh, asymptotic formalism because it's, your question is the same one, because it asks if the asymptotic works or not. And many people try to, to do it. And uh, Alex Reed generated the, uh, something like 100 billion events to 
to, to try to see if uh, our formulas, uh, when, what we use also for the locals effect are correct and uh, they are perfectly okay. So, mm -hmm. so I think that in retrospective, at the time we did not know how to test because we did not have the capability to do Atlas plus CMS uh, more than uh, 10 billion events. But nowadays, people play with it enough to, to see, they know exactly the limitations. We know that when we look for a very rare signal, then it's uh, very dangerous to, to use the asymptotic formalism, but still conservative. Uh, but for the discovery, I tell you something crazy that we discovered, but uh, it's my opinion. I stress that it's my personal opinion, and, uh, and I, I fought a lot for this because what happens is when you try to test the ASIMO with more than a billion events, it means that you have to toss 10 billion events with each one carries 100 or more nuisance parameters. And many times we saw that uh, things look like they break the asymptotics and then it was discovered that the problem was not breaking the asymptotic. The problem is that when you generate 10 billion events, some tosses, some Monte Carlo generations break the random generator doesn't work well or something breaks in the numerics. Does it have to do with the period of your... your oh, wait a second, so, wait a second. So, we, so, so my personal conclusion was at the time, and I really believe in it still today, that sometimes the asymptotic is more accurate than using uh, Toy Monte Carlos. And this is still under debate. But it is because that when you generate so many Toy Monte Carlos, you sometimes are bound to do numerical mistakes in, the, in your tossings. So, 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 I, I think I understand. I understand what you're saying about like generating close to ten billion events. I just wanted to, to find out if, 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 if the problem has to do with your random number generators not being completely random, and the the, the pseudo random number generators. Sure, really because it has a finite uh, accuracy sometimes. And sometimes it's because uh, it's because in the tossing itself, it's not only the random generator. It does exist. You have some divisions, but things that are close to zero, which gives you not a number and crazy things like that. Believe me, ask Ketevi, we spent a billion nights on this and uh, ah. testing and testing and testing. By the way, who is asking all the questions? I, I want to know how the people. Oh, no. Can you show me a picture or something? I want to know the persons. I forgot to ask if people can put pictures at least because it's very frustrating that you see me and I don't see you. No, no. <laughs> can you turn on your, your camera? Uh, okay, cool. Because it's not the first time you ask me many questions. I want to know who you are. Okay, for next time you do it, okay? Next time you put a picture at least. But, but Kola, could you... Could you uh, explain who you are and what what you are doing? Um, yeah, so I'm part of I'm part of a, a, the the group an analysis group with Katevi and okay um, Simon Connell and uh, my mm -hmm. part right now is to try and put the uh, a limit setting code <coughs> limit setting code um, the the code that you use to generate to um, set limits set limits on parameters um, to a, a GPU so that you could do, do it quicker. Ah, yeah. nice. Yeah, okay, nice. You, you mean you use FPGA or nothing to do with FPGA? No, 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 it's a, it's a graphics processing unit. Ah, though. GPU, okay, so, yeah, okay, GPU. okay. Yeah. So you, you, it's the same processors we use for machine learning? Yeah, 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 yeah. it's the same okay. yeah, yeah. for machine learning. Nice. Okay. Next time you put a picture of you, or oh, I won't let you into the. <laughs> I'm not sure if I. I don't. I, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't want to scare all the students away with my ugly face. <laughs> no, come on, Cola. I uh, just. <laughs> okay. No, I'll, I'll put. I'll put my picture next time. <clears throat> okay. 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 Um, I am. Um, Actually, I have one question. L let's say, for example, that you're doing searches and you look, I don't know, for a given topology, let's say jets and missing ET, 
And uh, for example, the right answer in nature is, for example, I don't know extra dimensions, but you're testing your null hypothesis, which is a standard model versus, let's say, a SUSY alternative hypothesis. And then if the, the SUSY events um, uh, produce enough um, um, uh, signal, then, then yeah. you, you, could, you could get to a wrong conclusion, um, you know, uh, by uh, finding some discovery, maybe not five sigma, but let's say, uh, finding some excess which uh, you think is compatible with a given uh, SUSY model, whereas yeah. in reality uh, it's uh, an extra dimension that is behind this. And you'll need to, you know, um, cross-analyze different channels, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, afterwards to find out the mistake. So can, can you comment yeah, about okay, this? Okay, okay, okay. Let's see if, if I understood you correctly. For example, in SUSY searches, many times, the, not only in SUSY searches, in many of the beyond the standard model, many times the signature is simply a, a lot of, uh, an excess in missing ET or things like that, right? Right, yeah. So what you say is that sometimes due to mismodeling, you have an excess in events with high uh, ET, and that will lead you to the wrong conclusion, right? No, 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 no. My, my point no. is that, for example, in your search topology, uh, Suzy could contribute. And for example, nature could have chosen that it's extra dimension. But since the, the excess... Ah, of the yours is alive, the classical questions. Yours is the classical questions that, uh, for example, let, let's say that 25 years ago, I was, uh, I was asked uh, when I was just... Uh, a PhD or I don't remember a postdoc or something, so somebody which Katev, he knows probably by the name of Jim Pinfold, he, he raised his hand and he asked me, yeah, you, you look for the Higgs, but suppose there is Susie and Susie will uh, lead you to a conclusion that there is a Higgs, but actually it came from a Susie. Is that your question? Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, my, my answer was the same one that I will answer you now because I don't have a better one which is, uh, these are good troubles. I hope that that will be a problem because what you say is that I will get a, a Susie signature, but actually it will come from extra dimensions, etc. cetera. So, uh, so in all these searches, we assume that there is only one model which comes from uh, beyond the standard model and the others do not exist. And uh, of course, of course it can happen that uh, we either get a signal for one model when the, the reality is actually another model, etc. That will come in time, but I don't think that uh, we can uh, take, I, I don't think that it makes sense to, to take all these uh, crazy things into account because uh, you test one model at a time, and if you do see some deviation from the standard model, then you will start to, to test a, a few models, then you can start, okay, say the deviation comes from SUSY, says the deviation comes from another model, and what you can do, what you can actually do is see uh, which model gives you a higher likelihood for this specific model, or if you like a, 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 a smaller p-value, okay? Okay, okay, I see, yeah. But uh, okay. what you do is you compare p-values, that's the, or you can do a, a, a ratios of likelihood between different models, because this is a classical question that was asked in every file study that we had that when you have, say, for example, only three models and you want to compare three models, the background and two signal models, what do you do? So the only solution came up, people came up with, they do two test statistics, one to test one model versus the background, another to test the other model versus the background and, uh, and uh, see which one gives you a better rejection. That's the only okay. way. Okay, okay, I see, thank you. Other questions? Hi, Steph, can I ask a question? Sure. Yes. I'm not sure, sure I'll be able to, to make it for next week or... Um, well, since I missed the, the first lecture, I have just... 
Uh, Adam, maybe you know me. I think we meet in Munich a uh, long time ago. I don't, I, I, I don't see who's talking. I don't see who's talking. How can uh, I, how can I know? From Tangier. Yeah, I remember you, but I don't, but why don't I see? Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I remember you. Uh, I, I just want to know your comment about the 96 GV hex excess from uh, CMS and also from, well, if we trust uh, lib data also, there's some bump also in lib data. I'm not sure, which bump, sorry? Not sure that I'm familiar. I'm talking about the 96 GV hex that CMS is uh, making some noise with. Oh, I'm not sure that I follow this. Well, why don't you send me by email and next time I will, uh, I will express an opinion about this, okay? Okay, I will send you the, the send reference. Me an email to see what you're talking about. Okay, uh, thanks. Okay. So, Ketevi, there will be another chance next time, so they can ask more questions. Yes, next time. I will. Uh, I will uh, come back to you and propose uh, some. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Please go ahead yes. with your question. Uh, sorry, because my mic is. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Thank you. So, thanks, Ilan, for this uh, discussion. Uh, let me find the zoom. Yes, it is. So, how to define the fake fake signals, Ilan? So, you know, the data includes everything. So. According to this uh, formula, so S is the signal, right? But what about, I mean, the conclusion, if this is the fake signal? But this is exactly, the p-value is, is actually coming to, to test if this is a true or a, what do you mean a fake signal? What do you mean a fake? You mean that, that, that you, you decide that there is a signal by mistake? Yes, yes, yes. This is exactly the meaning of a p-value. The p-value, you can look at it. I did not talk about it in my first lecture because I did not want to confuse you too much. Mm -hmm. But the p-value the, the p was born from something we call a, a type 1 error. It's, yes. It's, it's, the p-value tells you what is the likelihood, uh, what is the probability that you reject the signal hypothesis, but you are wrong by rejecting it. So this is why this is why we use a very very tight uh, p value, very small p value, which is two point eight ten to the minus seven, and we'll see that this accounts to even less than that. Uh, to, uh, this is very very small because when you take all uh, all other factors like you kind of indicate that might give you a fake signal, when we take them into account, this is where we go into what we call the Lukather effect. So the 2 10 to the minus 7 say amounts to say even 2 to the 10 to the minus 5 even. So, so if the, this uh, p-value that we took means that, in, uh, that there is a probability of a mistake in 1 to 10 to the 5, 1 to 10,000 experiments, now it's up to you if you believe it or not, okay? But the whole idea of the p-value is to quantify what is the mistake that you allow yourself to fake a signal. That's the idea, and, and you choose the value of p-value that you feel comfortable with to go to the world and say, I have a discovery. Now, it is true, it is true that we have seen already uh, four sigma effects that were fakes, but this is why we use the uh, five sigma and uh, it, it can still be wrong. Yes, it happened, uh, uh, but, but somehow you, you feel inside as a physicist that there's something wrong and you don't publish it. The cases where we published a five sigma discovery and it was a fake, I don't remember one like this. Uh, even the seven, the famous 750, which was close to four sigma or more, was never, it's the, the 400 theoreticians paper that called it a discovery. We never dared to say that we have a discovery and we had a good reason. It was not because it was four sigma. It was because we did not really see it in the other experiment. Remember, there are two experiments here. And uh, if you see something and the other experiment doesn't really see it, you lose your trust in it. So uh, your question is half philosophical because there are many, many factors and it's very much related to my next lecture. There are many, many factors that you should take into account when you decide that you go out to the public. 
when you decide that there is a discovery. And one of them is uh, that uh, you will believe a signal better if you see it in uh, two independent places. Thank you very much. Uh, in the beginning of the Higgs discovery, so uh, 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 Atlas and CMS tell us that they, they are two channels, two golden channels, like Higgs to gamma gamma and Higgs to uh, four leptons. So I, yes. I think I think at some a point at four leptons it was a something like fake signal or disappear by the time of increasing the energy or something yes, like that? Yes, yes, yes. I, I show it in many of my talks that uh, that uh, we had a three sigma and then it went down to two sigma and then it came back. Yeah. Thank That's you very much. It's all sophisticated. Uh, we use, usually, usually we use the, the Higgs signal public code. Uh, so this Higgs signal public code written by uh, Sven and Heinemeyer and this yes. company. So, ah, you talk, yeah, 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 okay, okay. You mean this, uh, yeah, I forgot, how, the, the Swiss knife of the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, yes, exactly. So, so when we use that code, so of course, the, it, it, this code is based on chi-square, chi chi-square. So, uh, which most of them, most of the rejected uh, points are rejected at uh, two sigma. So, do you think, uh, according to this talk... Yeah, but there uh, is a difference, as I, as I explained, we are much more loose when we when we do exclusions. Much more loose. We don't care to to make a mistake when we make an exclusion because uh, next time we'll see it. But it's a discovery that we are very sensitive to. So when you do a ninety five percent confidence level exclusion some for new signals, we had to go this way because because there are so many models, so many possibilities that if we if in order to exclude each one of them we will. Uh, use the same criteria for discovery, we'll never finish. We will still have all the models in the air now. So we use a 95% confidence level because we have so many models and we know that if something is real, uh, this exclusion will uh, actually, uh, will not stand reality. We will immediately see the signal again and again. Oh, th thanks a lot. So it's still one, one more, uh, because, one more because of the signal, the significance formula. So, I saw in many, many books, uh, textbooks, the, the formula of the significance, uh, significance formula, sorry, is, is really, it's depend on many, many things like the error of background and the error of signal, something. No, no, so, no, listen, uh, listen, 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 no, no, listen. There are two, there, there is, uh, there are two formulas. One of them is, is the parallel to S over square of B, which I show today. But there is another one which has to do with the which replay which which has to do when there is a, when the background has a, an error a systematic, then the, there is a different formula. Since you asked it, I will show it the next time huh? and how we derive it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Okay. Thank you. Actually, we never published it in a paper. It appears in some note that uh, Glenn wrote with me. Sometimes I will show it. Ah, it's also in the PDG now, I think. Yeah, it's a, because Glenn is the editor of the PDG. This math formula is in the PDG, both formulas, also with the one with the systematic of the background. But I'll show it. In, in some of, uh, of uh, my papers, so we use that formula with the error in the background. And so. Yeah, the delta B, yes. Yes, so a delta B, yes. Yeah, 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 okay. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. That's the one that you use to show that sometimes if the systematics, the background is too big, you can never reach a five sigma. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, and there, there is a condition which we never understood why this error should be less than 10%. So, so something... Uh, the, 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 I, I can show it, I can show it. Okay, 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 thank you very much again, thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have uh, one more question. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, on, on slide 21. Oh, I need to go back to my... Uh, uh, wait a second. Yeah, what about slide 21? 
Yeah, so I, 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 I didn't really have a, like a graphic understanding of this before, but then I think I understand it quite well now. It's just like I wanted to clarify. Ah, thank you, thank you. Okay, so, so you, see I'm not, you say I'm not such a bad painter? No, this is very Picasso-like. <laughs> yeah, you, you mean this one, okay. Yeah. So I don't think so, it's Picasso-like, I, th I think I'm really bad. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so I just wanted to, 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 to just clarify my understanding with the, with the, with the um, profile likelihood, right? So the numerator of, of Q, of Q, the, the, um, numerator the, like, is the, uh, the, the numerator, yeah, the numerator is, is the value here and the denominator yeah. is the value here. Okay, wait. Yeah. The numerator is, is, is the minimum of the slice. But and given then, some mu, given five, yeah, yeah, yeah. given five, and then the denominator is the, the, the global minimum. Is here. What's the global minimum? Okay, cool. Now, yeah, now I understand. Yeah, thanks. Okay, maybe a last question. Yeah. Uh, if not, I think it's time to, to thank Ailam for this uh, very pedagogical um, lecture on a difficult subject. And uh, we will see uh, the rest of the talk with the look elsewhere effect uh, um, uh, next time. Uh, Ketevi will arrange her for yes. another uh, date. Okay, thank you very much, Ailam. I will uh, post, uh, as usual, the, the video on the Indico page. So thanks yes. everyone for joining. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.